Hello everyone. I'm getting ready to go live in a few minutes at five o'clock, which is in about three minutes. I'm going to be starting the World Flutes Tour Around the World. This is part of Make Music Alliance Day, and this is a free one hour um, demonstration and lesson of about over a dozen different kinds of flutes. And I'm going to talk about uh, how you get started learning them, some of the characteristics of the flutes, and uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, type them into the comments. I won't be able to stop during the demonstration to um, answer the questions, but if you put your questions in the comments when the broadcast is done, I will go ahead and try to answer your questions individually. And if you want to find out more about me, please visit my website, cocopele.la, and I'm cocojo at cocopele.la. So uh, let me just gather a few more things and I'm going to start playing and teaching. We have about uh, one more minute, so I figured I would start off with the biggest flute that I own. Uh, you can't take it on an airplane, that's pretty tricky. I'm just making a shadow on my face here. Anyhow, this is a walking stick drone. I'm going to back up, back up, back up, hold it up. It is taller than I am. Uh, it's a custom-made Native American style flute. And I think it's uh, almost five o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. flutes to talk about and demonstrate and I'm going to be moving sort of geographically around the world and I figured I would start right here in the United States with Native American style flutes and one thing I want to clarify is when you're looking at Native American flutes um, sometimes you'll see the term Native American flute sometimes you'll see the term Native American style flutes, that is a legal requirement that the makers need to comply with. If you are an enrolled tribal member, you can market your flute as Native American made. If you're not enrolled or not Native American at all, then you have to call it a Native American style flute when you sell it. However, for the purposes of just playing the flutes, talking about the flutes, talking about the music, we just call them Native American flutes. We don't call them Indian flutes anymore. Um, and the reason for that is that this is an Indian flute from India. So the proper terms Native American flute, and you might see them sold as Native American style flutes. This is Native American style, um, custom made walking stick drone flute. Um, this is the more unusual kind of flute. So I'm gonna play a little bit more about the flutes and then talk about how they're made. So, traditionally the flutes were made out of wood, but a lot of makers have experimented with um, more durable and creative materials. This one, I'm not going to tell you what it's made of, but it looks like onyx. 
you can see through it lights up um, i'm going to play a little bit and then tell you what it's made of and tell you a little bit more about the blues This beautiful sounding instrument is actually made out of cast epoxy resin. It's made by Peter Churcher. And so Native American flutes have a very distinctive sound. And the reason for that, I have a handy little teaching tool here. This is a Native American flute cut in half. And so what gives it the distinctive sound is the air comes in here goes through this air chamber. It goes up under the block or the bird. That's why it's usually tied on and this one's held on with a rubber band. Goes under the bird or the block, goes through this very, 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 very narrow channel and then hits, exits and hits and splits against this sharp edge. Half of the air goes out of the flute, half of the air goes into the flute, starts vibrating and then the air exits the holes and that's what makes the sound. So if you're looking to get into Native American flutes, um, first thing to know is that they are, hang on, I need to get back up a little bit. There we go. The first thing to know is they have a very easy learning curve. Um, you, you don't need to learn to read music to play it. If you do already read music, there's a system of notation called Nikai tablature, which um, is, is now sort of the standard for writing down music um, expressly to be read by Native American flute players, uh, but you don't need to read music to learn how to play it. So when you're looking at these flutes, the first thing you need to know is what key is it in, what scale does it play? The key is determined by the lowest note that comes out of the flute. In this case, it's D sharp. The scale for the Native American flute is basically a Dorian mode scale. Some people call it pentatonic minor. If you leave out one of the notes, if you leave this down as an anchor finger, you do have a pentatonic minor scale. If you pick up the fingers one note at a time. That's a D-sharp Dorian mode scale. Um, the, the scale and the range, sorry about that, I keep having to step out of the frame there. The scale and the range is very much up to the maker. They're made in all different keys. They're generally made in a scale that corresponds to either pentatonic minor or Dorian mode. Um, I was showing you a very modern um, six hole flute made out of epoxy, but there's a more traditional style, more traditional. This is cedar. This is a Michael Graham Allen flute in E. Cedar, originally five holes. This is where the pentatonic minor came from. So a more traditional sound, this flute's an E. So that would be a more traditional style five hole flute. Whether you like six hole or five hole is really very much a matter of personal preference. Um, the six hole flutes have advantages for some kinds of music and to play in particular keys and modes. The five hole flutes work a little bit better in other keys and modes and it's really up to you. And explaining the whole history of Native American flute and the five holes and the six holes, that would take an entire hour so I'm not going to be able to cover that now. Leave questions and I'll answer them later. So let me show you another flute. Something that's very popular among modern makers of Native American flutes. This is a high spirits triple harmony drone. There are fl three flutes here. The main flute with six holes, the first harmony flute, and then the bottom harmony drone. This one's an A.
Little Harmony Drone. Um, this tradition actually comes by way of South America where double and triple flutes with harmony notes and drones were actually made out of ceramic. So this is a, a modern adaptation of a more ancient South American tradition adapted to be made out of wood and applied more towards the Native American flute. These are very popular. Um, as soon as you start getting into Native American flutes, probably um, the first flute you buy won't be a drone, but the second or flute, second or third flute you buy is going to be a drone <laughs> because they're so much fun. So let me show you one more thing. about Native American flutes specifically. The, the demonstration that I showed you with this um, very sophisticated and complex air chamber design, this is a fairly recent um, development amongst Native American flutes. Um, there's a long history there. You can find out about it on Flutopedia. Um, they have a big section where they talk about the history of the Native American flute and how this design came to be. It was not an accident. Um, the older style of flute, especially from the southwest in the vicinity of um, the Prairie Rock archaeological site in Arizona, is a much simpler design. It's a straight tube carved out with the finger holes laying um, basically um, where the maker's hands landed on the flute. There is no special sound chamber. I'm going to try to hold it up to the camera here. You can see straight through it. It's a straight tube, um, just like a Japanese shakuhachi or a Persian ne. And you split the air against this um, sh slightly sharpened edge. And for this flute, um, the rim-blown flutes, which is what this is called, they have a much steeper learning curve because getting the air to split correctly Basically, I'm going to hold this sideways. You can see it's notched just a little bit, and your air has to come out of your mouth and split, part into the flute, part out of the flute. And that's the angle you're trying to get. And with a big, long flute like this, it's a little bit trickier, but um, the sound of these flutes is very haunting, um, very otherworldly. It does not really line up with um, European tuning like the modern Native American flute. And it's even hard to get the whole thing in the frame. I'll talk more about how to learn to get a sound out of rim-blown flutes when we get to uh, the shakuhachi. It's a little easier to demonstrate there. Um, but anyway, rim-blown, very unusual sound. Um, be prepared if you want to take up this instrument to have a long learning curve, being able to make a sound out of a rim-blown flute. It's, uh, it's not easy. And I've seen people who make these flutes uh, pick them up on stage and start to play and have no sound come out. So they're a little tricky. Uh, they take some time to get used to, but they have a very beautiful sound. And before I leave, things that are uh, from the Americas. Uh, since Hawaii is a state now, I have a Hawaiian nose flute. This one was not made in Hawaii. This one was actually made by Buffalo Moon Flutes based in Texas. They actually specialize in making flutes out of um, buffalo horn and other horned animals. Um, but they also made these bamboo nose flutes. So the Hawaiian nose flute was used as a courtship instrument. There is no written music. It's always improvised. Um, the nice thing about this flute is once you've played it, no one ever asks to borrow your flute.
So a uh, very beautiful haunting sound, um, traditionally used for courtship. Um, you can get them made in Hawaii. Uh, they're not all equally easy to play. I found this design from Buffalo Moon um, is fairly easy to line up. This hole here is sort of very forgiving and adapting to the angle that you want to play. Uh, they sound super cool and um, they do not have them listed on their website. They make them from time to time whenever they feel like it. So if you go look up Buffalo Moon flutes, give them a call, drop them an email, find out if they're going to be making any of these soon. If you want um, a, a one that's made here in this big, beautiful bamboo version. All right. So I talked a little bit about Mexico and South America. And so when we get to that part of the world, we have a couple of much more um, distinctive from each other kinds of flutes. So the pan flute, also known as Zimpona. This is um, a special uh, pentatonic version. It has fewer pipes. I'll just play for a little bit and then talk about why you would pick one with fewer pipes. South America and it's considered a folk instrument and often when it's used in an ensemble the person who's playing the pan flute has sets of pipes with only the particular pitches that they need for each particular song that makes it easier to get around on the pipes some of them are made with a double bank of pipes so you don't have to go horizontally so much you just go back and forth like this. So having fewer pipes that are specific to the song you're going to play, it makes it a lot easier to get around. Uh, a couple things about pan flutes in general. They are a rim blown instrument. There's all different qualities available online. Um, a better professional made, the side that's facing you, the bamboo edge will be smoothed off and polished rather than raw bamboo. Raw bamboo is going to leave you with splinters under your lips, so you want one that's been completely polished. This one's actually made of maple, um, so that, and it's very accurately tuned. It's made by um, uh, Brad White. He's panflute.com. And, um, you know, very sturdily made, well-tuned, uh, you know, easy to play with a rim-blown flute. Once again, remembering you're, you're aiming to do that split of the air across the top. So to get a sound, you're basically just blowing straight across the top like blowing across the top of a bottle. Um, there are different qualities of sound you can get if you lean in a little bit. You get kind of a louder, more focused. If you aim up a little bit, you get a much more breathy sound. The breathy sound is often considered more traditional. The darker, more focused sound is considered sort of more modern and classical. The other cool thing about pan flutes is the way that you make vibrato, that wobble in the sound, is you actually shake the instrument. you can do with this is when you have a nice polished one you can do these great runs which kind of sound like cartoon music
So this is a more um, folk traditional style. They make concert versions. Concert version, this is called a grand tenor. It's in C major, three octaves. And you'll notice with a concert version, I'm going to try to hold it up to the camera, the side facing you is cut off at a very, very sharp angle. And the reason for that is on a concert version, you're going to be able to play sharps and flats by changing the angle of the instrument just like you would with a shakuhachi. So, so the scale. And if I wanted, for example, um, that was a C major scale. If I wanted something with an F sharp in it, for example. Now that's F natural, but if I wanted F sharp. by changing your head angle, the flute angle, and you actually blow it down a half a step. So the learning curve on a concert pan flute um, is not difficult. It takes a long time. You have to get used to placing the instrument um, against your face to get the right pitches and getting a control of and knowing how to grab the note above if you want it's actually the sharp version of this. And so getting practiced at the head nod and the flipping and jumping a note and bringing it down, usually the way you get a sharp is you flat the note above it. Um, it's hard to bend them up high enough to get a really good sharp. So here's the F. You can get it up about a quarter step. You can't bring it all the way up a half step. So if you want an F sharp, you're going to grab a G flat um, and blow down. So that's the concert pan flute. Um, if you've never played a pan flute before and you just think they sound um, cool and you just want to sort of get the hang of it, I'd recommend start with a smaller one. Start with a pentatonic or a one octave pan flute because it's lighter, it's easier to carry with you. That tenor won't fit in any piece of luggage that I own. Um, so you start with a small one and uh, it's, it's just much easier to start to get the hang of it and decide like how much you like it, how much you're into it. When you get to the point where you wanna play, if you wanna start playing classical music or pop tunes or um, uh, more ex expansive folk tunes and you need that full, you know, double octave range with all the pitches, then upgrade to a bigger one. But a cute, handy one that's easy to carry around, well-made, tuned with polished edges, polished edges. I cannot underemphasize polished edges. Um, you'll, you'll get a lot more use out of that. So let me go to another famous South American flute. The cana. So with the cana, there are um, two basic um, types of cana: inexpensive folk flutes that cost about ten to twenty bucks if you buy them at a festival or from um, a group that you find playing and they're selling. It's made of bamboo. It's got a nice condor carved into it. Professional flutes, tuned. Um, wood inlay, blowing edge, lacquered on the inside as well as the outside, um, 10 to 20 bucks, over 200 bucks. Um, how much better do they sound? Depends on you. If you're a classical musician, you'll probably think the professional one sounds a little bit smoother. If you prefer kind of the, the folkier sound, you might think that the original one sounds more authentic. So. What does everyone want to play on the cana? Of course, oh, six hole flute, major scale, the thumb hole on the back, you must cover the thumb hole. 
It is not optional. Let me get oriented here. Um, you can find uh, endless tutorials online. Um, it's actually a composed tune. It was composed for an operetta. It's not um, traditional. There's actually was a copyright on it. So everyone learns to play El Condor Pasa. Um, very traditional. If you get one of these, learn to play El Condor Pasa or no one will be happy with you if you can't um, play that. Um, what is particular about a cana? Once again, split blowing edge. I'm going to hold it up close to the camera. Split blowing edge. And what you're trying to do is get your airstream half into the flute, half out of the flute. If you're having trouble learning to get a sound out of any of these rim blown or split edge flutes, the first thing I recommend is just grab it with the top hand. Um, for most of these flutes, it doesn't matter whether the top hand is your left hand or your right hand. A lot of flutes are played traditionally right hand farthest from your face. Um, I think the camera is flipped around, um, but I'm holding up my right hand, right hand farthest from my face, left hand closest to my face. So whichever hand you're going to play closest to your face, grab the rim blown flute with this hand and place the flute. And just practice placing the flute and splitting the airstream without having to deal with any fingers. And with all of these split airstream instruments, um, the little pointy corners are going to be right up there in your lips and kind of pointing into your mouth. If you, if you have um, a more open embouchure, the sound will be fuzzy, but you'll have a, a bigger target trying to hit the splitting edge. So you'll run out of breath really fast. The better players have really scrunched down that opening to be really small to conserve air. So that's scrunched down really, really small. The other thing to experiment with with one of these um, rim blown flutes is if you're if the opening in your lips is a little bit off center, like if it's not perfectly oval and it's a little bit taller on one side than the other, as you can see with me, it's taller on the left than the right. So it's perfectly acceptable with the cana, the um, the the rim blown flutes, the shakuhachi, all of these flutes that require you to um, center in your airstream and split across there. Find out whether you get a sound more consistency on the right-hand side of your mouth or left-hand side of your mouth. So for me, so here I'm aimed kind of in the center. a sweet spot a little bit to this side of center so as you're learning these instruments there's a lot of things that are very different um, for world flutes from playing classical flute and one of the things is whatever position the flute is in to get the best sound that's the best position for you so playing a little bit off center perfectly acceptable um, and but that's a thing to experiment with, especially if you're having trouble getting sound out of the middle center of your mouth. All right, that's the cana. Um, music for cana is written down, although a lot of people uh, learn it by ear. And the other thing is that they, uh, because most of them are being made in South America, they are named according to the lowest note that comes out. So in this case, this one's in G. 
but they refer to the pitch names by their solfege names. So this is referred to as cana and so, cana and so, as in so la ti do. So cana and g is a cana and so. All right. So I'm going to move on here a little bit. So I'm going to uh, skip ahead. There's another culturally South American Mexican flute, which are the ceramic vessel flutes. I'm going to save them for a little bit later when I cover ceramic vessel flutes uh, from around the world in general. So now we're going to move um, across the ocean into Asia. And this is the Chinese Ditsa. This is um, basically sort of a, uh, a lower quality beginner's ditsa. And this is a professional ditsa that comes with in a beautiful hard shell case and everything. I'm going to demonstrate a little bit. I'm going to demonstrate on the um, beginner's ditsa first. Um, and then I'm going to explain why I'm not playing this one. So six hole flute, just like the Irish flute no thumb hole these extra little holes on the end these are tuning holes they enable you on a bamboo flute to keep the length and the beauty of the flute and you drill holes until you have opened up the bottom enough to set the fundamental pitch of the flute which is right about here so let me play a little bit and then i'll explain a little bit more about um, what you're going to experience if you are trying to buy one or try one out incredible buzzing sound like you have trapped some bees. That is a membrane here called the demo. Um, it is part of the sound production of the flute. The flute will not make sounds. It will not make notes with this hole uncovered. Um, if you try to buy one used, I guarantee you that the demo is either broken, missing, or has been covered over with scotch tape. Um, the demo is actually made of a material called gold beater's skin. If you are vegan, you're not going to be happy when you Google what's gold beater skin. Um, the, the demo is attached on with a water soluble glue and then stretched tight. And the, this membrane responds to the moisture in your breath. And so as soon as you start playing the flute, it gets a little bit looser and starts to vibrate like the head of a drum. And that's what gives it that buzzing sound. Uh, if the demo breaks um, or gets loose or develops a leak, it's going to stop making um, sounds. And then in an emergency, you can just cover the whole thing with scotch tape, and then it'll sound just like a bansuri or any other uh, transverse bamboo flute, and it'll stop buzzing. So this very, very thin gold beater skin, which oboe players actually also use to wrap their reeds. They call it fish skin, but it's not made of fish. Um, but that's what gives it the buzzing sound. How do you know if the demo is not installed correctly or has gotten leak um, or has gotten loose? getting the octaves are not speaking correctly so I'm guessing that somewhere in in this demo it looks like I have a leak you can see some air bubbles under here so I have a leak and so I have to um, basically you just wet it with a sponge scrape it off wipe it clean get a new piece of demo um, to glue it down they sell it with a traditional um, block of uh, hard dry um, glue it's called uh, air gel. Um, 
but a lot of people cheat and use Elmer's glue sticks. It's really quick, really easy. Just draw a little circle with a glue stick, put the, the membrane down, pull it tight horizontally, uh, let it dry, and you should be good to go. And you can also um, buy the Gold Beater skin online because OBA players use it too, so it's available um, in the US. It's not too hard to get. You can get it from China too. So, Ditsa. I'm going to move on here. Oh, one more thing to say about Ditsa. With the Asian flutes, the name of the key is named according to the note that comes out when you cover the top three holes, the three holes closest to your face. So this one is engraved somewhere with the key. It is considered a flute in D. There we go. Flute in D. This note is D. Six hold covered is A. And the reason they do that is because this D is considered the home note. So this is not making a major scale going up. This is basically, um, if you were to count from the bottom note, it's a Mixolydian scale that starts on so according to our Western scale. So. So from here, that's the major scale, that's the octave. The rest of this is the descending major scale down to the fifth. So important to know, um, if you get a flute from China and, the, the, and they refer to it as a flute in D and it's even written on the flute, D is three, hold co three holes covered. It is not the fundamental note of the flute. The reason they do this is because the flutes could have any one of a number of extra holes. They could have an extra hole drilled on the bottom would change the lowest note. So they always refer to it by three holes covered. Three holes covered, this is do, this is so. And that's what you'll find when you're looking for ditsa. All right, let's move on a little bit here. Um, with ditsa, you can uh, read music that's been um, transposed, you know, correctly for the key of your ditsa. It reads just like Irish flute or classical flute, so you can find a lot of stuff that's been um, transposed as well. All right, I'm going to switch to another Asian flute and give me a moment to wake up. A cool effect. Hopefully y'all can hear it. Since I'm just running it, I'm gonna make it hopefully loud enough. Hope you all can hear that. I'm gonna try to set it up so that one speaker is blasting into the other. Bansuri. This is an Indian flute because it comes from the country of India. To get into world flutes, get used to calling this an Indian flute or a Bansuri. And this other thing, made by Native Americans or people working in that style, Native American Indian from India. This one's technically made in the U.S. by Bansuri Jeff.
So for, for most of this class, I'm not doing anything with effects processors or backing tracks. You know, you can find all those things online, but I really wanted to talk about what the instruments really sound like because people who get better at a flute spend a lot of time practicing just listening to the sound of the flute. No microphone, no backing tracks. Um, they really get learn to get into the sound of the flute and learn how to get all the different tone colors and the depth of the sound and the quality of the sound out of the flute. The reason I fired up the um, software for this one is that is iTabla Pro. And for those of us who are gonna have trouble um, getting together with other instrumentalists, the nice thing about iTabla Pro is um, this is a professional app and it's got all of the ragas, which are the Indian scales. It's got the tabla patterns. There are hundreds of ragas, hundreds of tabla patterns. You can tune it to your flute. Um, this flute I had to tune 26 cents flat because it's just flat today. Um, so you tune it to your flute exactly so that everything um, fits and you can select all of the instruments in a traditional Hindustani band and pick what pitches the um, the uh, tamporas are playing. You know, you can pick all of the information. You can pick what the harp is playing, all of it. So a couple things to know about Bansuri. If you're going to get into this flute, there is a long formal period of study. And with a Bansuri master, the music is always learned by ear. And the ragas, of which there are hundreds, they're like sequences of notes that are like scales. They're memorized. And then when you perform, you pick a raga and um, there's a very formal um, method by which you express the raga um, and then develop it. You, you, you play it first in a section called the alap, which is a slow introduction. Then there could be a jar, which is a, a little bit more rhythmic section. And then there's the gat, which is the main section where you have created a little composition um, and jazz, jazz people would say you develop your line and then you go on and improvise for the next 20, 30, 40 minutes. So um, very sophisticated and the tabla uh, follows along with you because they know what, what they're doing and they know what you're doing. Um, something to remember if you're trying to buy these flutes is they refer to the pitches often by their um, uh, Hindustani solfej. So while we would go do re mi fa so la ti do, um, they refer to it as pa da ni sa re ga ma pa. And when they're talking about the pitches relative to what you're setting, if you're if you're doing settings in iTabla Pro, the only place you'll see the Western notation of the pitch is in the very beginning setting. And then as soon as you go past there, it's going to refer to everything by the Hindustani names. You know, what do you want Sa to be? What do you want Pa to be? So they're not going to go back and, 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 and transpose all those pitches. So it's worth learning that um, nomenclature. When you buy these, they are described by, once again, three holes covered. So this flute is, is called... Um, saw equals c sharp so this is c sharp and the lowest note is d sharp actually there's one note below there's actually a low d down here so saw equals uh, c sharp and that's how it would be described um, another thing to know about these flutes is the lower you get the longer they get and the harder it is to cover the holes so when you're learning Bansuri, one of the first things you're going to do is if you were a classical flute player and you're used to curling up your fingers, you know, in this classical position, you're going to get used to spreading them out, flattening them out, because as you get into the bigger Bansuri, you're going to expand that piper's grip to, to cover the holes on the longer, deeper flutes. So I think I'm running a little bit behind time because I've been talking too much. So... Um, there's a lot of beautiful ornaments. I was demonstrating some of the microtones, which are part of um, Bansuri music. So you're going to get into a more sophisticated understanding of 
music and pitch and form. This is a this is a long learning process. Um, if you just want to get one and play around with it, lovely. But if you really want to get into the music, there's a long um, period of formal study to get good at it and to be able to play with other musicians who expect you to know the ragas and the tabla patterns um, and the forms of improvisation. So we are going to move along here. Okay, I'm going to go quickly through um, Shakuhachi. So Shakuhachi from Japan, traditionally made of bamboo. This is an actual vintage Shakuhachi made in Japan and restored here by uh, Monty Levinson at um, Taihei Shakuhachi or shakuhachi.com. And so uh, with Shakuhachi, they are um, made according, they're named according to their length. So the standard length of a shakuhachi is 1.8, which is what shakuhachi means. And their, their bottom pitch is often D. I'm gonna back up so you can see them here. So this is a standard one, uh, 1.8 in D. And it's a little bit long for me. This is a student shakuhachi from Japan made of maple. This is a 1.6 professional shakuhachi. And the difference um, in size makes all the difference in the world. If you have small hands and you're getting into world flutes, start out with the smallest version of flute that you can so you can get used to the finger patterns and the stretch because the bigger flutes are very unwieldy if you have small hands, and I have long fingers. If you can't cover the holes, you will always be frustrated. Start with a smaller one, and then as you get bigger, you can try the longer flutes. Uh, the difference between uh, 1.8 and 1.6, even though it's only one whole step in pitch, so this one, the lowest note is E, is much easier to play. <laughs> notes it's a pentatonic scale so one two three four five hole in the back very important you get the other notes in between those notes by a combination of half holing and head angle I'm going to back out so you can see both so So the process of half holing and changing the angle is called um, going down, is called um, uh, chumeri. And bending a note up by tilting your head up. called curry and so so these combinations of head angle changes and half holing are what get you the different notes of the scale um, the music is written you can get it transcribed into Western notation where it reads just like other Western flute music it's traditionally learned written in Japanese with the Japanese brush stroke brush stroke characters um, if you want to really seriously learn shakuhachi, this is another instrument where you apprentice with a master and uh, spend a long time learning how to read Japanese music, to learn all the different um, techniques, to learn all the vibrato techniques. Unlike um, classical flute on shakuhachi, there's five different ways of making vibrato and you always pick the notes and the type. There's no autopilot vibrato, if you start playing, you know, um, sakura with like ha 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 vibrato, everyone's just going to start rolling over. So the different kinds of vibrato. Or. Or. Or with the breath. And the one I like 
like the most. So if you if you pick up this instrument, you're you're gonna learn to get um, much more um, definitive control of vibrato and how it's applied musically, and also learning um, how to control um, half steps with half holding and head angle. You have to be with a shakuhachi. You are always completely in control of the head angle. You do not nod with the beat. You don't shake your head. You don't twine around and emote when you're playing because every time you move your head, you change the pitch. So a person who's playing shakuhachi is gonna get into a very zen position where they learn to be still and all the motions that happen with their face and their chin and their head angle are to produce a particular pitch or a pitch effect. So very zen instrument, um, very worthwhile. You can get lots of them made um, here in the US um, from shakuhachi.com or um, Shakuhachi U that makes um, ones out of uh, synthetic, like an instrument grade plastic. So um, worthwhile to study and learn a lot more about flute playing. So now I have to speed up um, I'm going to run a little bit past an hour, so for those of you who are planning to go um, listen to another lesson um, right, at the, right on the hour, I apologize in advance, but it's going to take me a, a few extra minutes to cover all the instruments I wanted to cover because I'm talking too much. Chinese Shao. So the Shao is another rim-blown flute like the Shakuhachi. And what's different about the shao is the modern ones are often made with part of the bamboo blocked off the back. This is called a bay shao or a, a beak shao or a block shao. And this makes it a little bit easier to get oriented against the blowing edge. And the blowing edge is very sharp and U-shaped, just like the cana. Um, but because of this block, it's a little bit easier to get the position. Um, it's got a lot of finger holes. It's got a thumb hole on the back. Three more holes for the top hand. Four more holes for the bottom hand are required. These are the tuning holes on the bottom. The reason a bamboo flute has tuning holes on the bottom is so you can maintain the beauty of the length of the bamboo, especially as it gets toward the root end. Um, this one is actually made of maple and dyed to look like bamboo. It's made by Jeffrey Ellis. And one of the principles of the shao is that with um, a lot of Asian flutes in particular, they work the scale by having anchor fingers. The anchor fingers that you use tell what scale you're gonna play. So I'm just gonna demonstrate um, the scales really quickly. So um, major scale has two anchor fingers. So you'll notice that the ring finger of the bottom hand and the middle finger of the top hand stay down, and that makes it a major scale. If you want to play a minor scale, switched coming back down so it takes a while to switch back and forth and stay oriented with the anchor fingers because you can tell I just messed up switching between major and minor because um, I don't I haven't played the show for a while um, so the the fact that you can can do this means that instead of being relegated to a pentatonic scale with doing a lot of head positions and half holding and stuff to get the different notes 
you have major minor scale and, and all of their related uh, pentatonic scales and their related modes by the fact that you have eight holes to work with and the anchor fingers and the cross fingerings enable you to get all of the different pitches. The thing to remember with this is it's a different fingering system from the bansuri or the Irish flute or the classical flute and getting used to the anchor fingers is going to take some practice. Um, and getting used to staying oriented in major or minor or breaking out into chromatics or related keys. This is going to take some practice to get those finger patterns to be a reflex and not be accidentally hitting wrong notes all the time. Um, that being said, of all the, the Asian flutes, it's got the most flexibility built into one flute. And this one's domestic, um, Jeffrey Ellis. And because it's not bamboo, it's not going to crack as easily, and you won't have trouble taking it through customs because it's only made out of maple. All right. I'm going to skip along here. Now we're moving over to Europe and the UK. Um, and I have a little Irish flute. Irish flute, six holes, D major. Tuning holes in the bottom. And a lot of you I know have already heard Irish flute, but now you're hearing it in the context of um, Bansuri and the other six hole flutes. And let me get a little cheat sheet here with my notes here. And that was a really fast version of Women of Ireland. It's normally played super, super slow. Um, what is special and distinctive about Irish flute, especially if you're coming from classical flute, is you play without breath vibrato. If you're going to add vibrato, you do the finger vibrato. And only on the slow airs and on the long notes. Um, traditionally, you don't use your tongue a lot to start notes. Um, notes are separated by ornaments. So ornaments um, called cuts, taps, and rolls are what separate the notes. And you mostly keep blowing. That's a thing they have in, com in common with um, the shakuhachi. Is another instrument where you don't usually use your tongue to separate the notes. You use ornaments of different kinds to separate the repeated notes. Um, and uh, they come in different versions, um, professional and folk. The difference between professional and folk, besides being about $1,000, so 400 1500 two octave range, a slightly smaller reach, three, three full octaves with chromatics. This is from Windward Flutes, and this is from um, Casey Burns Flutes. So if you need three full octaves with chromatics, uh, Windward Flutes in Canada, if you want something easier to start with, um, Casey Burns Folk Flute. He also makes professional ones, but the folk flute is his entry level, smaller holes, um, and only about 400 bucks. Don't quote me on the price, it's been a while since I bought it. So with Irish flutes, I am going to go over, so I apologize in advance. Um, I want to get to all the, the flutes I was talking about. Um, if you miss the end because you're going to go on and take another class, 
I am going to um, upload this to my uh, Facebook page so that it's there permanently so you can go back and catch the parts that you missed. So Irish flutes, um, named the keys named after the lowest note, six holes covered. They also come in piccolo versions. purple piccolo it's made out of purple heart but irish flute style uh, this is in d if you're gonna get an irish flute start with d it's the one that's the um it's gonna be the least mental transition because then you are reading the pitch the music's always generally transposed to d so you're looking at a d you're playing a d um that makes it for an easier learning curve and just while we're on um the transverse flutes and the little piccolos and things this one's actually in c this is a crystal flute this is a more european idea to take the the simple system flute irish flute concept and make it out of crystal these are a little trickier to play because these rolled edges you have to to land on them nicely and this little embouchure plate with the there's no plate really there's just like this rolled lip this is a little tricky, and if you get one of these in your classical flute player and you pick it up, you're like, oh, wow, how do you get a sound out of this? This is impossible. You have to get this little edge, and you have to kind of stick it up into the fleshy part of your lip, and then you'll get a sound. So, And I'm going to get real close to the camera. So it's going to feel really unnatural, you know, um, like you've got a, a spoon against your face. So they actually sound surprisingly cute and they don't really sound like glass at all. Um, so if someone like gives you one of these, uh, take a few minutes to learn how to get that sound and get that um, lip orientation there against that rim and they're cute um and keep the box it came in because i imagine this is pretty fragile but they're cool to use in a concert um because the wow factor by playing a glass crystal flute is pretty neat but it is the same as an irish piccolo they come in different keys too for people who want to get into world flutes they want written music or easy to learn music, friendly jam sessions, lots of YouTube tutorials, and zero learning curve in terms of the blowing and getting a sound, Irish whistle. So six holes, same fingering as the Irish flute and the bansuri for that matter. Um, uh, start out with one in D major so that when you're reading music, the sound that's coming out of your instrument is the same sound that you're seeing printed on the page if you're doing it that way. So this is a D whistle. Um, they used to be called penny whistles or ten, tin whistles because they were made of tin and they cost a penny. Um, this is a professionally made one from Ireland, uh, from Satanta. Uh, the modern ones, the sort of the high-end pro ones, are made of brass. They sound a lot more mellow than the ones that are made of tin and other random materials and the plastic ones as well. Though you can get plastic ones for um, 10, 15, 20 bucks. So the brass ones um, are worth it. If, if you come from the, the classical field or you've played another instrument and you have other professional world flutes, spring for professional whistles because the difference in the sound quality is quite quite obvious um and you'll just be happier with a professional instrument but a lot of people start out with the penny whistles um that only cost a few bucks and uh, are perfectly happy with those so
things you notice there is I, I had a half fold note there and I did some slides and some um, cuts and taps. So it's really easy to make progress on these quickly. And if you're willing to learn um, Irish tunes by ear, if you go to an Irish pub jam session, um, they tend to be fairly friendly towards beginners. So, you know, this is like an easy, easy entry into world flutes. You'll develop your ear and your ability to memorize. You can do all of the techniques with an Irish whistle. So all of the, the finger techniques. So you can do a lot with a whistle. Um, they're among the least expensive of the world flutes where you can get um, either a, a cheap one to start out with or a professional one will not break the bank. And um, you can learn a lot playing the Irish whistle that will translate over to a lot of the other flutes um, because you're not spending any time learning how to blow into it. You can spend all of your time learning to manage your breath and control your fingers and develop your ears. So it's, you know, it's a great sort of entry flute for wolf flutes. All right. I'm going to move over to that. All right. So now I apologize for running over. Um, I'll, I'll post this um, afterwards. You can go back and, and catch up. So now I'm getting into the most unique of the world flutes. These are the vessel flutes. They're shaped like eggs, animals, um, other creatures. This is a shun from China. It's in the ocarina family or ocarina family, depending on how you pronounce it. Two thumb holes in the back, six pitch holes around the front. It is carved with dragons. This was a souvenir um, brought to me by my sister-in-law from China. Um, it's gorgeous. I think they sound just the same if they look like plain eggs. You blow across the hole in the top like you're blowing across the top of a bottle. sound. Um, it takes a little bit of practice to blow them in tune. They were used originally um, as hunting calls to sound presumably like birds and other non-human creatures, um, but then they decided to put sort of more holes in them and make them so you can play tunes. Um, you know, I mostly keep this stored in a box because it's ceramic. Um, and it's just, it's a cool instrument. You can find videos on YouTube of people playing shun. Um, and they do actually play songs on them and get pretty good. Uh, it takes a while to get the hang of this, um, to blow it in tune. All right, other things in the Vessel Flute Ocarina family. This is a beatbox turtle. It's a pentatonic um, ocarina made like a turtle. A lot of ceramic ocarinas come with a wrist strap or neck strap. Considering um, how easy it is to drop them because they're a little bit heavy and a little bit slippery, use the neck strap or the wrist strap. Um, this one is fun because it's only got five holes, four on the front, one on the back. And so for people who don't like keeping track of a 12 hole um, classical ocarina, this is easier to just jam around on. Um, and kids love this. If you say, you know, you want, you want to see me kiss a turtle, they're like, yeah, yeah, kiss the turtle.
with these sort of simpler ocarinas, you can get a lot of really interesting effects and you're not having to manage the 12 holes. And just to give you an example, you know, so the, the classical 12 hole ocarina, you know, there's, there's lots of people who make them. You can get lesson books from Mel Bay. Um, they have the same finger pattern actually as a classical flute. And as I get covered, classical flute, open G sharp. So. Notice this is my G sharp pinky is down. There we go. So, you know, every ocarina has the holes in a different place. So if you're going to learn to, to play them, don't buy a whole bunch of different ones because they're relatively inexpensive and then be switching back and forth. Um, get used to playing one so you get oriented with the patterns. Um, with a concert ocarina, you can read, you know, any, any classical or pop music that's been transposed into the key of C, um, like a flute. Um, if you have like a four hole ocarina or a five hole ocarina, there's actually a tablature system for that that shows you how to play tunes um, by showing you the patterns of opening closed holes for uh, four and five hole ocarinas. All right, so let me just make sure I haven't forgotten anything. All right, this is my favorite flute. Not really, it's my favorite flute today. It's the, mo it's the one that inspired the most amazement um, when I first saw it. This is a rattlesnake triple harmony drone flute. It's made by Nash Taviwa. Um, he's based in Orange County. His family's from Oaxaca, and they are traditionally clay flute and whistle makers. And so this is his design. It's a rattlesnake. You can see the head is the head of a rattlesnake. And the tail is a carved rattlesnake. The only thing that could make this better is if I get me a rattlesnake rattle and tie it onto this so I can shake it. So triple drone, perfectly tuned between the two, um, the two snake bodies or the two parts of the snake body. Um, they don't come in different keys. It's the key that he made it in. This one's kind of um, F minor-ish. because you can go up or down melodically with either hand. Um, so it takes some thinking to get used to this. Um, because you've, you're blowing into three uh, embouchure holes at the same time, it's fairly hard to do any kind of tongue articulation with the front of your tongue. So to separate notes, I usually wind up using um, really sharp um, breath attacks. <laughs> With some difficulty, you could get a K, um, but it's uncomfortable, so I just learned to use um, breath attacks. So that's a that's one one drawback. When you, as soon as you get into these triples. You are not going to be able to use your tongue to separate notes. You're going to have to get real good control of your abdominal muscles. Really like punch, 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 punch to separate notes if you want to add some drama to it. Um, Nash Taviwa, he only makes these one at a time. Um, so if there's one on his website that doesn't say sold, that means he's got one. 
Um, if you're dying to get one of these, um, contact him through the website and say you saw Joanne Lazaro playing it, uh, Coco Joe playing it, and now you have to have one, and um, he will make you one. Um, I always wondered like how consistent he was with making these, because this is a really hard design to mold. I bought one of these at the um, uh, 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 Native American flute get together, and I went to that same uh, gathering the following year, and he had only made, as far as I know, one more flute the following year, and it sounded like the amazing twin of this flute. Um, so he doesn't make very many. He only sells the ones that turn out perfectly. Uh, so if you look at this and you're like, oh my goodness, I have to have it, um, give him a call and say you want one and he will make one. He does not have a lot of them in stock. Um, totally worth it, his own design, traditional Oaxaca ceramic flute making. So that's basically the end of what I was gonna talk about today. I know I've gone completely 15 minutes over, um, but I hope you got some good information here about this. And as you all um, are dropping off, There are other cute flutes. Um, so this is basically the end of the formal presentation. You can find out more about me at cocopele.la. You can Google Joanne Lazaro, J-O-A-N-N-E-L-A-Z-Z-A-R-O. -N -N -E you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the Make Music Alliance page. I wanna put in a plug here um, for the world flute society worldflutesociety.org i'm not on the board or anything i'm listed in their teachers directory but they are an excellent jumping off point for learning more about flutes from all different cultures around the world um, the people on the board are basically sort of the top folks in their field in terms of irish flute shakuhachi native american flute um, lots of other different um, uh, flute cultures and styles and they have lots of free resources and it's a good place to get started and contact people and find out more about any of these flutes. Uh, you can also leave me questions. Um, leave me questions on Facebook here and I will get back and answer them or go back to the uh, Make Music Alliance page and my contact information is there as well and I hope you've enjoyed it. This is a Su Ling from Indonesia. Uh, Suzanne Tang actually has these made. She supports like a micro business um, in Bali, Indonesia, and she has these Su Lings made and they are um, really uh, beautiful. So last tune. <laughs> summer solstice happy father's day um, the shirt is from tie-dyehobohawaii.com um, find me on facebook or at cocopelli.la um, send me any questions you want i will answer them bye bye